Welcome back to the second part of Lecture 5. So, in the first part of Lecture 5, we looked at a workflow that allows us to obtain apparent viscosity data as a function of shear rate from rotational data obtained with parallel plates. Now, that workflow can equally be applied to a conan plate or to a coet cell once we have a fluid of arbitrary rheology. We saw that the workflow was very, very similar to the capillary rheometry Rabinovich correction. Now what we're going to do is examine why shear flow doesn't tell us the whole story for complex fluids, and we'll introduce what we mean by a complex fluid in a minute. This motivates the need to use another technique, a technique that examines what happens to a complex fluid in extensional flow. And there are a number of different techniques that one can use to examine extensional flow behaviour of complex fluids. We're going to talk about capillary breakup extensional rheometry which is a different technique to both capillary and rotational rheometry. And the workflow that we have to get rheological data is very fundamentally different as well. However, what it does is to give us insight into how extensional flow fields, and remember you can find these in all sorts of processing flow scenarios, pipe entries, pipe exits, radial flows, spherical flows, and so on and so forth how those types of flow field affect complex fluid systems. So let's have a look to start with about what we mean by a complex fluid. So here on the board, I've put a cartoon of a shear flow. I have two parallel plates, top and bottom in light blue, and a fluid in between them. Now, if that fluid is a Newtonian fluid, we know what the relationship between its extensional behavior is and its shear flow behaviour is via a Troughton ratio. We know that the Troughton ratio will depend on the exact nature of the flow, but the extensional viscosity and the shear viscosity are related intimately together in a very predictable and known way. However, for complex fluids, fluids that have some kind of structure, and in this case, now we'll have a look at those wiggly lines in the yellow fluid, which are a schematic representation, grossly oversized, of a polymer chain, we can see that a shear flow will change the conformation or the nature of these polymer chains. The reason why is that shear flows are rotational. If we think about a force balance on an element of fluid somewhere within that yellow box, we can see that as we approach the top plate, the fluid sees a higher velocity compared to the bottom plate and that produces net rotation. And so shear flows are rotational flows. Hence, if you have an entity that can be rotated, for example, a polymer chain, or a platelet, for example, in a suspension, a solid platelet, or a bubble in a bubbly liquid, or the discrete phase of an emulsion, which is two immiscible liquids mixed together, then we can see that that rotation will affect the position of that entity, in this case the polymer chain will rotate, the mica platelets for example in a suspension will rotate and it will also change in a suspension or an emulsion or a bubbly liquid the packing fraction as well and that entity as we'll see in viscoplasticity and multiphase flows has a strong impact on the measured viscosity. So we have this problem now as long as we have structured liquids, complex liquids shear flows are going to rotate and change the nature of the structure. Now, if we think back to our polymer chains, as a polymer chain rotates, one end of the chain is seeing a slightly higher velocity than the other, which will in fact stretch it a little bit. And that stretched chain will store elastic energy. So the stress field within the system has changed as a result of that. Now, Rotational flows don't stretch that much. If you have a truly elongational flow, the nature of stretch in the polymer chain will be a lot, lot higher. Also, the re structural rearrangement of a suspension or an emulsion or a bubbly liquid will again be a lot, lot more severe. And so extensional flow fields really strongly affect the structure of these complex fluids. And we can't easily relate that to properties you measure in shear. And so we need to look at how liquids, complex liquids, behave in extension to get an accurate rheological characterization for every flow scenario. 
The technique we're going to look at is one called capillary breakup extensional rheometry. It is one of a family of techniques that involve getting a fluid between two pistons and pulling it apart. One other technique looks at how the filament forms as the pistons move. Capillary breakup rheometry looks at what happens to the fluid once the pistons have stopped moving. So let's look schematically how we achieve this. Here we have our yellow fluid between our two blue pistons. We're going to pull the pistons apart and we form a fluid bridge between the upper and the lower piston. Now, once any inertial movement of the fluid has died down due to the pulling apart of the two pistons, a fluid filament will form in the middle of that bridge, which is where I've put those two arrows, and it will form with a given diameter, which I've called D0. Now, over time, and under the action of surface tension, that fluid filament will decay and shrink in diameter. Ultimately, the fluid filament will become so thin that it breaks. The experimental measurement that we take is the normalised diameter, so d of t over d0 as a function of time. And this diameter thinning is related to what is resisting the stress imposed on the fluid by the surface tension. And if we think of a Newtonian fluid, the only stress that's going to be present in this laminar regime is going to be viscous stress. If we think of a complex fluid, then we've got stresses that are involved with the stress relaxation of the polymer chains as they retract from being highly extended by that initial piston displacement. So we have a flow field that is purely extensional. We have an experimental measurement that now relies on optical techniques. Um, early capillary breakup rheometers used to use laser micrometers to measure diameter as a function of time. Nowadays we can use high-speed cameras and depending on the nature of the fluid sometimes we can get away with nice inexpensive solid-state high-speed cameras which will give five, six, seven hundred frames per second. For low viscosity liquids we need very high frame rate cameras, maybe 10,000 to 50,000 frames per second in order to get enough data to understand what's going on. So let's look at the sort of data that we get. Here on the board I have a graph and what it is plotting is that normalised diameter, d of t over d naught, as a function of time. The blue line is the experimental data obtained from a solution of xanthan gum, which is a food gum, it's a polymer, a, po a polyelectrolyte, as a function of time. And what we can see is that once that filament forms, when d over d0 is 1, it decays over the course of about 15 milliseconds to about 0.1 and then suddenly breaks. Now, unlike capillary rheometry and rotational rheometry, the way we analyse this data is by comparing this thinning curve to a number of standard thinning curves obtained from known rheological viscoelastic constitutive equations. So it is no longer suitable to say, let's analyse any arbitrary liquid. We have to look against liquids of known rheological response. So on the board now, I've placed the curve for a Newtonian fluid and we can see that there is good comparison between the experimental data and the model. Um, the breakup time is a little bit different but one of the things to realise about experimental data from capillary breakup rheometry is that it's very very hard and it takes a very skilled operator to get consistent data for the same fluid. And so whilst we've only plotted one data set on this curve, it would be far better to maybe have 10 different experiments and have a look at the consistency between those experiments before making a judgment as to how well or how badly one of the standard diameter decay relationships actually fits. So talking of standard diameter decay relationships, I'm going to give three examples. We can derive, and we will derive in the next part of this lecture, the diameter decay for a Newtonian fluid. And we can see in this expression on the board, we have a parameter alpha, that is surface tension, that's what's driving the flow. What's resisting the flow in a Newtonian fluid is of course viscosity, which is there represented by eta zero. X is something called a shape factor. We'll talk more about that in the next part of this lecture. For viscoelastic fluids, we have different diameter 
thinning curves. So the first viscoelastic model we're going to meet in section B of this course is the Maxwell fluid. Now for Maxwell, we no longer have a viscosity. We have a relaxation time that governs filament thinning. This assumes that the dominant stress in the viscoelastic fluid is due to elastic forces, not viscous forces. There are other more complex viscoelastic constitutive equations, and we will also see the Giesecke's constitutive equation when we look at viscoelasticity. You can derive an expression for filament thinning for a Giesecke's fluid. It's somewhat more complex, and annoyingly, it is implicit in diameter decay, but luckily explicit in time, so we have to use the equation differently. And we can see that the relationship involves now a viscosity, e to zero, our relaxation time, lambda, and another parameter, uh, a, which is called a mobility parameter. More about that when we talk in depth about viscoelasticity. The key message here is that there are different standardised diameter decay relationships that we compare to our experimental data. So let's summarise a few key points. Capillary breakup rheometry is one of the techniques that we can use to look at the elongational behaviour of complex fluids. And the motivation, don't forget, is that complex fluids fluids typically with some sort of structure, will have that structure changed quite radically by an elongational flow in a way that we can't necessarily predict from looking at shear behaviour alone. Capillary breakup rheometry stretches a fluid filament and then examines what happens to that fluid filament once it has been formed. You will find the diameter of that fluid filament decays as a function of time and that rate of decay we can compare to an existing rheological relationship. 